On today's episode of Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez, my film review is Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, followed by my segment, Allow Me to Explain. And it all starts right now. This is Jordan Ramirez, and you are listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. And now, here is my latest film review. My film review for this episode is Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, released in 1984, directed by Hayao Miyazaki, starring Sumi Shimamoto, Ichiro Nagai, Goro Naya, Yoji Matsudo, and Yoshiko Sakakibara. Here is the synopsis of the film. To quote from the beginning of the film, 1,000 years after the industrial civilization, the Sea of Decay, a swamp exuding toxic vapors covered in earth strewn with rusting ruins, threatening human survival. The one area in the face of the earth that is untouched by the Sea of Decay is the Valley of the Wind, where the air is clean, the forests are untouched, and the residents live in harmony. That is where Princess Nausicaa resides, played by Sumi Shimamoto. The princess of Tomoka, Kushana, played by Yoshiko Sakakibara, arrives to the Valley of the Wind along with the rest of her knights from the kingdom to use the last surviving giant warrior, one of the giants that caused the seven-day fire that led to the Sea of Decay, to eradicate the large insects known as the Ohms. Nausicaa knows that violence and war is not the answer to stop the Sea of Decay that has already affected the planet, but that there should be another way and that humans should be at peace with nature rather than destroy it. So what do I think of this film? I admire the rebellious courage of director Haya Miyazaki to talk about these issues that he deeply cares about that is expressed in this film. One would think of the film as similar to Dune, plot-wise, the Frank Herbert saga that has previously been adapted to film twice. It does have that feel thematically and visually of a dystopian science fiction story, but as you watch the film with the elements of European-style armor, tapestries, and settings, It feels more like a dystopian fairy tale rather than a science fiction film. In regards to the characters in the film, I feel that the only standout characters are both Nausicaa and Kushana. They are both princesses from two different countries, but when it comes to how they handle things regarding to the face of the planet, their ideas start to differ. Nausicaa's stance is more of a humanist approach as well as of a pacifist tone when it comes to violence and war. Kushan, on the other hand, comes from Tomoka that is more militaristic and believes that force and violence is the answer, even though it feels more corrupted. She is not a firm believer in humanity and peace, but she is not a villain. She believes that what she is doing is the right thing for both the residents of the Valley of the Wind and for everyone else on the planet. Nausicaa's actions show humanity and warmth to make the people around her care about nature and to dispel the fears about nature as well as the insects and what led to the earth being polluted. I admire the animation from some of the key animators of the film, including Hideaki Anno, Tadashi Fukuda, Yukiyoshi Hone, to name a few. Anno is someone who is familiar to fans of Japanese animation since he is one of the founders of Gainax Animation and he also is the creator of Neon Genesis Evangelion. From a visual standpoint, it does have the feel of watching something like a Mad Max movie. From the color choices to show the apocalyptic environment in the beginning of the film when Lord Yupa is trying to find the survivors from south of the Valley of the Wind that is already overtaken by the spores from the Sea of Decay. The color choices shown in the film are shown muted colors such as grays, browns, Sometimes there is reds and blues and other colors to emphasize this environment. For the underground sea of decay, it also has some muted colors to visualize a dark and lightless environment that lies underneath the surface of the earth where the giant insects live. And when you look at the valley of the wind, the color choices are more bright and somewhat vibrant as you see it, like greens and yellows and browns and reds that draws the viewers into the world. The music by Joe Hisaishi does have a techno feel as you listen to the music that varies from each sequence of this picture. For example, as Nausicaa is on her glider, Hisaishi starts to use a sort of cyberpunk techno pop 
that gives it a grunge feel. Another example of his music cues is when we go underneath the Sea of Decay and witness the giant Ohm insects, we start to hear calm music with a sort of sitar heard in the background almost presenting an exotic feel to it. I have to admit that when I heard the voices of who was playing the characters, I did not realize that the main protagonist was played by Sumi Shimamoto, better known as Yukiko Kudo from one of my all-time favorite animated series, Detective Conan, the main protagonist's mother. Another actor whom I recognize as the voice of Mito is Ichiro Nagai. He was a veteran voiceover artist who had done hundreds of animated shows before his death in 2014. He had done shows such as Ranma One Half, Urusei Yatsura, Detective Conan, and was in the original Speed Racer, also known as Gegege no Kataro. Another voice actor in the film who is familiar to fans of Lupin the Third is Goro Naya, who plays Lord Yupa in the film. He was better known as the voice of Inspector Zenagata before his death in 2013. Kushana's right-hand man, Kurotawa, was Iyamasa Kayumi, who had done numerous animated shows as far back as the 1960s decade, including the animated series Astro Boy. But I know him as the voice of James Black, also another character from Detective Conan. Kushana is played by Yoshiko Sakakibara, who had done voiceover work for shows such as Mobile Suit Gundam Double Z, Bubblegum Crisis, Pat Labor, and Helsing. Hayao Miyazaki made his directorial debut with The Castle of Cagliostro from 1979 that was a departure from the Lupin III franchise, and even though the film was not a huge hit at the box office, he did gain notice from the editor of Anamage magazine Toshio Suzuki. Suzuki encouraged Miyazaki to create some works for Anemage's publisher Tokuma Shoten. At the time that he finished making The Castle of Cagliostro, Miyazaki was shopping around to bring his own ideas to be made into films. They were rejected. The publisher Tokuma Shoten asked Miyazaki to do a manga. Miyazaki did just that. He began working at writing the manga in 1981, and it was published the next year. It became the biggest hit for Anemage that year. Miyazaki was approached by the founder of Anemage, Hideo Ogata, and Tokuma Shoten, Yasuyoshi Tokuma, to do a film adaptation of his manga. At first, he refused the offer, but agreed to do it with one condition. He would direct the film as well. Anemage originally wanted to turn the manga into a 15-minute short film, but Miyazaki wanted to make it into a 60-minute OVA original video animation. Finally, Anamage responded by saying that it should be a feature-length film. The producer of the film, Iso Takahata, was hesitant at first to join the project before the animation studio was chosen. Since Tokuma Shoten didn't own an animation studio, Takahata and Miyazaki ended up choosing the minor animation studio Topcraft. They both chose the studio because of its artistic talent that could bring the lively atmosphere of the manga for the film. Pre-production of the film began on May 31, 1983, and Miyazaki had to figure out how to adapt his massive manga into a workable screenplay. So Miyazaki decided to refocus the attention to the Tomolkin invasion of the Valley of the Wind as a narrative purpose, as well as other elements from the manga to be incorporated into the story. When it came to the influences for Miyazaki's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, some of the influences that he used were Lord of the Rings, Nightfall by Isaac Asimov, Hot House by Brian Aldiss, and Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea. Isao Takahata hired experimental and minimalist composer Jo Hiseashi to compose the score for the film. Animation work for the film began on August 1983 and was done by animators who were hired for the film who were paid per frame. One of the notable animators was Hideaki Anno, whom I mentioned before. The production was completed on February of 1984. The film was released in Japan on March 11, 1984 by Toei Company. It was a box office hit in Japan and received positive critical praise on its release. When the film was released in the United States on June 13, 1985, it was heavily edited and retitled Warriors of the Wind. It was changed so that it would be marketed as an action-adventure film for children. The environmental messages were pulled out of the heavily edited film as well as the subplot involving the large Ohm insects, and most of the characters' names were changed, and Nausicaa's name was changed to Princess Zandra in that version. Miyazaki was dissatisfied with the heavily edited version of his film, that he adopted a new policy in his contract that included a no-edits clause of his films for further release overseas. 
The film was properly re-released as a faithful dubbed version of the film by Walt Disney Pictures and was released on DVD in 2005. After the film's successful release, it led to the founding of Miyazaki Studio Ghibli, as was cited as an influence on the development of anime and the creation of other animation studios in Japan. It was even ranked as one of the best animated films in Japan. The film's influence was also seen in the video game series Final Fantasy created by Hironobu Sakaguchi, which he admitted in an interview. Video game developer Yukio Futatsugi from Sega cited the film as an inspiration for his 1995 video game Panzer Dragoon. Other games that have been influenced by the film included Metal Slug 3, Cyber Core, and Viewpoint. Manga creator Katsuro Hoshino, creator of D. Gray Man, said in an interview that she regarded it as her favorite animated film that she watched multiple times when she was young. One thing I will say about this film is that even though it is a dystopian fantasy film that provided a bleak outlook on the future of human civilization as a result of pollution to our planet as well as war, the film does inspire hope and optimism that makes it one of the best feel-good films that you can certainly enjoy. One thing I would remind my listener that as you evaluate the film for its pro-environmental and anti-war messaging stance that feels relevant in contemporary times, and what one can do when, since we are already seeing the deadly effects of climate change already today and the bleak, pessimistic outlook of war that we are witnessing today in Europe and across the globe, that is one of my takeaways that I will leave for this film review. It is a highly recommended film that I hope you would enjoy. We will be right back with Allow Me to Explain. As the Sundance Film Festival is ongoing as of right now, the independent film industry had been struggling for the past few years, and maybe the return to in-person viewing and screening is a good thing since independent cinema is struggling to gain traction with audiences since they are only critical favorites but box office flops. And is the return to in-person screening as well as viewing able to give it life to the independent film industry? The short answer to that is yes. It's time for Allow Me to Explain. During the past few years, the independent film industry had been struggling to get distribution deals and buyers because of the pandemic, and even before that, because of streaming platforms like Netflix and superhero movies like Marvel that have failed to get financing deals because of the actor's busy schedule on either of those projects, either a movie for Marvel or a project for Netflix. The in-person Sundance Film Festival may be the boost that the industry needs at this very moment. Joanna Vincent, who was previously a film producer and now the current CEO of the Sundance Institute, explained in an interview about the importance of the return to in-person festivals at Sundance, quote, We've missed being together. There are things that can't be replicated in virtual festivals in terms of the conversations you have waiting for a film to start or the connections you make while you're waiting to pay for a coffee or taking the shuttle to a screening, end quote. The independent film industry at this moment has been facing a box office struggle to attract audiences even though they have attracted critics. But executives of independent film companies do not believe that they are giving up since they know that audiences' tastes are changing with the interest in offbeat stories. Ariana Boko, president of IFC Films, quote, It's not that audiences aren't coming out, it's just that the people who are showing up may be different, and the kind of movies that appeal to them may have changed. It's more of a smart house crowd, than one that's younger than the traditional art house audience of over 50. But I don't think the content we're making has caught up with that, end quote. The Los Angeles Times reported about the different types of distribution companies that will be dominating this year's festival, quote, In recent years, streaming services such as Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime Video, and Apple TV Plus have paid outsized sums of money for titles, only for their non-traditional release strategies and unpredictable algorithms to seem to soften their impact. Meanwhile, distributors with a stronger investment in theatrical exhibitions such as Sony Pictures Classics, Roadside Attractions, Focus Features, Searchlight Pictures, Magnolia Pictures, and IFC Films all strong presence at Sundance before the streaming services were forced to compete with unprecedentedly deep pockets, end quote. The independent film industry has ranged from hopeful to cautiously optimistic when it comes to the buyers at the festival. According to the website Deadline.com, quote, One streamer insider tells us that this year's lineup of largely art house titles has them prioritizing about half of the 10 they make time for at previous Sundances, 
Other sources tell us distributors such as A24 and Focus Features have enough product in their annual slates and aren't necessarily enough to buy given the wonkiness of the specialty box office, despite sending their buying core into the snow, end quote. One of the factors that hindered the art house business is the long-running length time that was an issue last year. Films like Tar and Triangle of Sadness clocked in at over two hours. This year's titles at the Sundance Film Festival are under two hours long. Titles such as Sometimes I Think About Dying, which clocks in at 91 minutes, and The Paw Generation, which clocks in at 109 minutes. But there is also the sense that some of the biggest streaming services, like Netflix and Amazon, are engaging in cost-cutting efforts as well as layoffs at their companies for a possible recession. John Sloss, a veteran manager, agent, and founder of Cinetech Media, said in an interview to Variety, quote, If you hook the seven streamers up to a polygraph, they'd probably admit that their content budgets are close to an aggregate of $120 billion. Obviously, that's not spent entirely on Sundance movies, but that's a lot of money, end quote. Even though the Sundance Film Festival is returning to in-person screening and viewing, It still has a virtual option that made sales agents at the festival unenthusiastic about the whole thing. John Sloss. At the end of the day, hopefully Sundance recognizes the needs of the market and the importance of getting buyers to attend. If films premiere virtually the day after, you're going to lose three-fourths of your buyers in the audience, end quote. Another sales agent, Josh Braun, co-founder of Submarine Entertainment, which is a production and sales company, said, quote, I can live with it but I don't love it. You can't replicate the feeling that happens when you have a room full of buyers seeing and feeling how an audience of real people is going to react to a film, end quote. The Sundance Film Festival reassured to the sales agents that it has allowed films to have an option to opt out of the virtual component, even though more than 80 films will be available digitally to pass holders. Joanna Vincent. We want every film to be covered every film to be reviewed, so this gives us an opportunity to have more people at the table and have more people part of the conversation, end quote. When it comes to getting independent perspectives to have their voices heard at a time when the world around is changing, the topics that the films cover at this year's festival are gender power dynamics, immigrant experience, the war in Ukraine, etc. Roger Ross Williams, the director of Life Animated, said, quote, Sundance became this powerful force and put independent filmmaking on the map. It remains even more important today when huge corporate interests are controlling a lot of the product out there. We are losing space for true independent voices, and Sundance amplifies those voices. When I was there with my first film, I had nothing. I didn't have a distributor. They just liked my work and invited me." End quote. Writer-director Mariam Kasharvaz with her new film, The Persian Version, that is now at the U.S. Dramatic Competition this year, said in an interview for Los Angeles Times, quote, The fact that they champion women, they champion queer people, I can't think of any other place that has done it to that degree. And Sundance, not only do they show the work, but they've nurtured it from early stages. They support you as a career, end quote. The important takeaway from this is that no matter what the future might bring for the distributors and the filmmakers that make these independent films, the independent film industry needs younger voices to talk about the issues and topics for today that they care about as the audience for arthouse films are aging and need a fresh reboot. The independent film industry may have faced an onslaught of regression during the past few years because of a lack of distribution deals and buyers, as well as the COVID pandemic, but I still remain cautiously optimistic about the future of the Sundance Film Festival and the need for voices from different perspectives, no matter your race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or country of origin, even though the festival is still ongoing before January 29th. I am glad that there is some progress being made, even if it's starting off slowly. Independent films are a part of who we are as viewers and storytellers, and what these stories can do to make us laugh, think, cry, or any other type of emotion that we evoke as we watch and make these films at the festival. If you want to learn more about the Sundance Film Festival, visit their website at https forward slash festivals.sundance.org to see their list of films and learn about the filmmakers at the festival. This has been Allow Me to Explain. You have been listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. This series is now available to listen to at 4 p.m. on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public every Friday. 
make sure to go to my blog website at filmtalkwithjordanramirezpodcast.wordpress.com. With my latest podcast episode on the page labeled Episodes, you can contact me on my social media feeds such as LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. I am also available on Letterboxd. If there is a film that you recommend that I would put for my next review, make sure to submit it to my social media accounts. And until then, I'll see you at the movies.